In this video, I wanted to review some aspects of the Deals Alder reaction, which was the focus of Learning Target Quiz 3 in the spring 2024 semester. And we're going to start with these two predict the product problems. And so our goal here, knowing that a Deals Alder reaction is going to occur because we have a diene and dienophile, is to predict the, the connectivity of the product, which is related to what we call regiochemistry, and the stereochemistry as well, the three-dimensional configurations of any newly created stereocenters. So one of the first things we want to notice here is that there are two distinct terminal positions or termini in the diene and dienophile. The diene has this carbon here, which is a CH2, and this carbon here, which is connected to this O-TMS group, where TMS is just the trimethylsilyl group. And the dienophile also has two distinct termini of the alkene, the double bond. We have this one here, which again is just a CH2, and we have this one here, which is connected to this ester substituent. So that there are two possible ways to connect up these reactants in a 4 plus 2. We could connect them as drawn here with kind of the ester group in the bottom right and the OTMS group at the top, or we could flip over one of the reactants, for example, the dienophile, and connect them so that that ester group is going to be on a carbon adjacent to the carbon bearing the OTMS group. And to decide the regiochemistry here, we need to consider resonance forms of the diene and dienophile and where positive and negative charges show up in these resonance forms. So for example, if we expand this ester group here, we can notice that carbonyl is electron withdrawing. And if we pull electrons into that carbonyl group like this, we're going to have positive charge in the resulting resonance form at this carbon right here, highlighted in blue. On the other hand, if we look at the diene, we can notice that the OTMS group, well, that's an electron donating group with a lone pair right here. And if I push electrons all the way to the termini, all the way to the end of the diene, I'm going to end up with negative charge at that carbon highlighted in red. And so the most nucleophilic carbon in the diene is here, and the most electrophilic carbon in the dienophile is there. And so we need to connect those carbons to generate the proper regioisomer of products. Now, we could do this, for example, by redrawing the, the dienophile. Um, and let's go ahead and do that, actually. So what I'm going to do is flip over the dienophile, erasing what we've got there. I'm going to go ahead and just sort of flip it over vertically. So now our ester group is up here. And in terms of highlighting, that leaves the purple carbon here now and the blue carbon here. And so now what we can do is envision the blue carbon connecting to that red carbon of the diene, the most nucleophilic position, relatively easily. Right now we can imagine those getting pretty close together. OK, so we've handled the regiochemistry here. right? We flipped over the dienophile. Now we need to think about stereochemistry. And the guiding light when it comes to stereochemistry, well, there are two aspects to consider. One is stereospecificity in the diene and dienophile. That's actually not relevant here, because we have only one substituent on each of the diene and dienophile. And the endo rule, which tells us how the dienophile substituents are oriented relative to the diene. The endo rule essentially tells us that, particularly for substituents containing pi bonds and or lone pairs, like this carbonyl group, those are going to orient themselves in an endo position in the nature preferred, lowest energy, kinetically favorable transition state, more or less. And so this tells us we need to essentially turn the dienophile over like this and orient the ester pointed toward the diene. So let me move things around a little bit. And let's draw that ester substituent now this way so that it's pointed toward the diene in an endo position. Now we've got a pretty good view of what the actual transition state for the reaction is going to look like at this point. And just to make things a little bit clearer, notice there's an H in an exo position right here as well. OK, so now we can start drawing the product. And to do this, now that we've kind of lined things up, I think it's easiest to start just with a cyclohexadiene. right? We can start with a cyclohexadiene with the double bond right here, recognizing that our electron flow in the actual 4 plus 2, if I erase our resonance arrows from earlier, electron flow in the 4 plus 2 is going to look something like this with, you know, for example, this double bond forming a bond here, this double bond coming around and forming a bond there, and these electrons going to there. And so we have a new pi bond here. 
and we've got two new single bonds, and then we can add the substituents, right? We can add the substituents in the appropriate positions. So we have a OTMS group here, for example, not worried about stereochemistry just yet. I'm going to fill that in in a second. And we have the ester group at a carbon adjacent to the one bearing that OTMS group. And we know this from our regiochemical discussion earlier and flipping over the diagonal file kind of vertically. Okay, now we need to handle the stereochemistry, and we can do this now that we've oriented everything. We know the ester goes endo from the Alder endo rule. We orient everything based on the out endo cis kind of toggle, or visualize this in three dimensions, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. For example, we could imagine in our mind's eye or even draw the transition state for this reaction with the diene file coming above or below the diene. And one thing we can notice from this, for instance, is that the H that's right here is going to be cis to this OTMS group, and the ester group is going to be trans to this OTMS group. We can recognize that if we think in three dimensions as this reaction occurs. We can also just use the out endo cis kind of toggle rule and notice, for instance, that, okay, this OTMS group is in, as we would call it, and the ester group is endo, and the rule then tells us out endo groups are cis, in and endo groups are trans, and how we draw them trans is, is actually not important because we get one of a pair of enantiomers. So for example, I could draw this on a wedge, and if I draw that on a wedge, it's necessary to draw the ester group on a dash to depict this trans relationship. The structure with the OTMS group on a dash and the ester group on a wedge is the enantiomer of this structure and is equally correct. And speaking of which, this structure is chiral. That's worth verifying on your own. And so we're going to add plus E and indicate a racemic mixture of the two enantiomers here. All right, let's move to the next one. So in the next one here now, this is actually a little bit nice from a regiochemical point of view since we have equivalent carbons on the ends of the dienophile and diene. So here's my dienophile, two carbons, both connected to the same groups, right? The dienophile is symmetric, which is quite nice. Actually, the same is true of the diene. The two ends of the diene are also equivalent, so there is no regiochemical issue. And in fact, we can immediately go to our cyclohexene, since we don't have to think about regiochemistry really in this problem, and just fill in everything that's connected to the cyclohexene. Now, with our diene on the right here, the new double bond in the cyclohexene is going to end up on the right-hand side. These two carbons are going to end up being these two carbons. And these two carbons here are the two carbons of the dienophile. So let me do some highlighting to show this. Here are those two blue carbons of the dienophile. Here are the two red carbons of the diene. And so in, in deciding how to fill things in from here, we should notice the two ends of the diene are connected by a CH2 or methylene bridge. We can go ahead and fill that in, not worrying about stereochemistry yet. And the two carbons of the dienophile involved in the reaction are connected to two carbonyl groups, first of all. And those come around to form a six-membered ring. And there's a benzene ring that is fused on the other side like so, so this is the connectivity of the product. But what we want to notice now is that we've created four new stereocenters. The red and blue highlighted carbons are now all stereogenic. So we need to decide whether to put things up or down and what's the relative stereochemical relationship between substituents attached to these carbons. How do we do this? Well, Again, the Alder endo rule is the first thing you want to think about here, and this dienophile has substituents that are definitely endo preferred carbonyl groups, and the fact that the dienophile is cyclic actually also helps this. And so each of these carbonyl groups is going to go endo. They're cis to each other, so they'll, they will both go endo. And if we look at the CH2 or, or methylene bridge in the diene, this is in, as we would call it, it is inside that arc formed by the diene carbons in the S cis conformation. And so N and endo groups will be trans. As above, it doesn't matter what we decide to do with the first stereocenter. For example, I like drawing wedges, so I'm going to put the methylene uh, bridge on wedges. Of course, both of those bonds are wedged, since both bonds point up to a CH2 that's above the plane of the screen. And then in endotrans here tells us that the carbonyl groups must be trans to the methylene bridge. And so we're going to use dashes to depict this here. 
and we have the stereochemistry of the product. And the nice thing about this, notice this is an achiral product. There's a plane of symmetry that runs horizontally right through the middle of the molecule right here. And so being achiral, we don't need to, and in fact don't want to put plus E in since this achiral molecule does not have an enantiomer. In this question, we are given a Diels-Alder reaction between uh, this diene, which is furan, and this dienophile with a sulfonyl group connected to an alkene. And we're actually given the two products that form A and B. These are the structures of the products of the 4 plus 2 reaction. You can see the new cyclohexene in this kind of boat-looking structure right here. And we're asked to complete the transition states by adding the dienophile substituents in these drawings right here. So furan is pretty much fully specified. We've got implied hydrogens at these four carbons, of course, but don't need to draw those in. What we need to do is add groups to the dienophile at these positions to depict the transition state that leads specifically to this product. So this is an exercise in visualization, and this is important to keep in mind that we're not really doing any deep chemical thinking here, per se. We're just laying down the substituents um, in such a way that we generate this particular stereoisomer A or this particular stereoisomer B. So it's an exercise in visualization. One thing I, I want to do is add to the structures of A and B implied hydrogens at these stereogenic carbons. And so what we can notice in both A and B is that the hydrogens are cis to each other and the sulfonyl and methyl groups are cis to each other. The difference between A and B is that they are enantiomers. They are mere images of each other and the product is chiral. So the transition states also need to be enantiomers and this is kind of a good visual hint to get us started here. Another thing you want to notice about the way the products are drawn is that this bond highlighted in purple is actually in the front in both cases. And so this whole collection of three carbons right here is also in front as is this collection right here. And so to go from these transition states to the products, we're going to take the transition state and kind of rotate it like this. And this means that, for example, this sulfonyl group is going to appear in the back or at the top of the transition state. So to put this another way, the way we generate the structure of A as it's drawn above is we're going to look at the transition state kind of from this angle. Right? And that this means that the SO2PH group is going to be in the back and importantly in an indo position. Right? This is trans to this oxygen, indicating that the SO2PH group approached in an indo position. Another way to think about this, which is equivalent, is this is kind of sin or cis to the new alkene and cyclohexene. This is an indo orientation. And in the starting dienophile, the methyl group is cis to the sulfonyl group, and so it must remain so in the transition state, right? And so we can go ahead and add an ME group down here, cis to the sulfonyl group, and we'll have the H's here and here. And again, the difference between A and B, oops, I mislabeled the transition states here. This should be TSA, and this should be TSB. The difference between A and B is they are enantiomers, and so the transition state leading to B, product B, needs to be the enantiomer of the transition state leading to A. We can notice, for example, that the sulfonyl group is still in an indo orientation, right? This is where that group would end up if it, had, if it approaches indo to the diene, sin or cis, to the new alkene and cyclohexene, and so it's still going to be in an indo orientation here purely an exercise in visualization, really. And again, because of stereospecificity, the methyl group starts out cis to the sulfonyl group and remains cis to the sulfonyl group throughout the reaction, including in the transition state, and the two remaining H's will be here and here. So you can notice that these two transition states are enantiomers of each other, right? If we put a mirror right here, or reflected TSA through a mirror sitting right here, we would generate TSB. Both of these are endo products, but they're the racemic mixture of endo products that forms when these uh, two reactants react, when furan as a diene reacts with this sulfonyl alkene as a dienophile. 
Finally, I want to look at these problems where we're applying the diels alder reaction in retrosynthesis, working backwards from a desired target to the starting materials we can use to make it. And the diels alder reaction is used kind of generally to establish six-membered rings containing one double bond. When it's all carbon, that would be a cyclohexene. Right, so we're looking for that kind of structure, that type of structure in the target to think backward toward the diene and dienophile that could be combined to make that structure. And in this first case, we're already at a very interesting scenario where the ring contains two double bonds. And there are actually two different ways to think about disconnecting or deconstructing this target to generate a diene and dienophile. And I want to show them both because one is going to be clearly better than the other. So one way we can go about this is thinking about flowing electrons this way. The Diels-Alder reaction is, is highly amenable to what I like to call mechanistic retrosynthesis, running curved arrows in reverse, essentially, to get back to the reactants by pushing electrons. And so essentially what we're doing here is just a retro 4 plus 2 to go back to a dienophile and a diene. In this case, the dienophile would contain a triple bond and the diene would be a pretty standard butadiene with methyl groups at the two and three positions. So this is one possibility, but it's not the only possibility. To show the, only possi uh, to show the other possibility here, let's imagine flowing electrons like this, starting at one of the other single bonds within the six-membered ring and moving electrons around like so. Notice in this case that now the left half of the molecule is going to be our diene. Our diene is going to have a structure like this with the two alkenes kind of sticking off or projecting from the cyclopentane ring. And the dienophile is still going to be an alkyne with a triple bond, but now it's going to be an acyclic alkyne with two methyl groups. And so let's do some highlighting of the carbons just to make this 100% clear. These purple carbons in the first case are going to show up here and here. In the second case, are going to show up in our alkyne dienophile. And these orange carbons here and here are going to show up here in our first disconnection, our first retrosynthesis, and are going to show up here in our second retrosynthesis. And, and finally, if we highlight these carbons, these guys are going to show up in the dienophile in our first approach and inside the diene in our second approach. So both of these are, are logical. I want to make the point, first of all, that there's nothing illogical about either of these disconnections because the curved arrows make sense. The curved arrows in both cases are retro 4 plus 2 curved arrows. And so the difference between these two is not really a, a logical issue. It's an issue of chemical plausibility, right? The problem with this is that this structure right here with a triple bond inside a five-membered ring is chemically implausible, right? This is not a stable compound because of the ridiculous strain that's going to be built into this triple bond lodged into a five-membered ring. And so the much better approach here is to do the second disconnection where we have an acyclic alkyne dienophile and a pretty standard looking diene here. So I'm going to put a big X through our first blue approach here because the much better approach chemically speaking, right, from a chemical plausibility practical point of view is the disconnection on the right. The tricky thing about the second case, I think, is, is finding the six-membered ring with the double bond and systematically, really systematically applying mechanistic retrosynthesis to go back to the diene and dienophile. In this case, with only one double bond in the ring, there's only one way to do this. These two carbons in the double bond in the target are going to show up in the diene necessarily. This is based on how electrons flow in the 4 plus 2 cycloaddition. And I think here, you know, just flowing electrons backwards, drawing some curved arrows to do the retro 4 plus 2 to get back to the diene and dienophile is very helpful. So for example, we could start at this double bond and go this way. You could also go the, the opposite direction. This will lead you actually to the same dienophile and, and diene, but let's go this way. And we're going to move electrons around as we would in any retro 4 plus 2 
like this and see where we get. I think it's helpful here to keep in mind that there's an implied hydrogen right here. This means that the dienophile is going to have a methyl group connected to a CO double bond, which also bears an H. And the diene then is going to have a butadiene structure with an ethoxy substituent right here. So just to orient ourselves on where the carbons are here, these two carbons in the diene are located here and here. And these two atoms in the dienophile are located here and here. And those are the atoms that link up via a single bond, uh, via single bonds. Important lesson here. The dienophile does not need to be an alkene, a carbon-carbon double bond, or an alkyne, carbon-carbon triple bond. Other types of multiple bonds can participate in the Diels-Alder reaction. And in fact, the same is true in the diene. The diene does not need to be an all-carbon situation. Heteroatoms can find their way into dienes and dienophiles as well.